improved forest management. Just saying it gets my juices flowing. All right, maybe it's not as sexy as reforestation where you're planting 10 million trees. Maybe it's not as sexy as avoided deforestation where you're preserving old growth Amazon rainforest from Peruvian gold miners. But at the end of the day, improved forest management is actually my favorite project type. The idea behind improved forest management is that we're taking forests that are middle-aged, uh, have a history of being heavily managed or uh, degraded in some way, uh, and instead we're, we're going to let them grow, or we're going to manage them more lightly. And by taking less wood, we're allowing the forest to accumulate more carbon over the lifetime of the project. And why I like these project types is that they're kind of the Goldilocks scenario. With avoided deforestation, you're not actually taking carbon out of the atmosphere. Those old growth rainforests that you're preserving, they're not actually removing carbon. We're simply preventing it from going back into the atmosphere. And with reforestation, it usually takes a decade or more for these projects to get off the ground. And the harsh economic reality of reforestation is that they kind of only work if they're being sponsored by timber companies. So a lot of reforestation projects are basically just monocultures. So improved forest management, on the other hand, we've got a full-grown forest with ecosystem services intact from day one. It's still sequestering carbon out of the atmosphere, so they're real removals. And we're also preventing it from being cut. So it's really a Goldilocks scenario. We're capturing carbon and storing carbon. And you know what? A lot of these projects may be taking place in Connecticut and New Jersey, and it may not be as sexy as some place like Brazil, but these forests are just as important. They're doing just as much for us, and the carbon removals are just as real. And so we really need to prioritize not just forests that are you know, in some interesting part of the world, but forests in our own backyard. One of the nice things about improved forest management, like I said, is that they've got a full set of ecosystem services. Because these forests are already full grown, there are there already habitats for countless wildlife species, they're already filtering water and air, they're already promoting biodiversity, they're already preventing erosion. So unlike reforestation, we don't have to wait decades for these benefits. <laughs> Another th nice thing about improved forest management is that these projects are basically instantly financially viable. We can start preserving a full grown forest any day. Whereas reforestation takes decades to get off the ground. It doesn't even start paying off usually until 10, 15 years down the line. Those trees take a long time to grow. But we've got trees back here in which we can start issuing credits for them immediately. We can start issuing avoided deforestation credits for them immediately, and they're already sequestering large amounts of CO2. And these are real removals. I've seen improved forest management projects that are sequestering 15 tons of carbon per hectare per year. And compared to some reforestation projects that are in their absolute peak, this is a little bit lower, but for the most part, this is still a lot of carbon that's being removed from the atmosphere. Now, even though the goal of improved forest management pro projects is to improve upon management and allow you to continue to harvest at a lesser rate, because avoided deforestation projects are so difficult to actually demonstrate in the developed world, a lot of people are actually preserving their forest and not cutting them down and simply enrolling these projects as IFM projects. And so, for example, a lot of improved forest management projects that I've seen, they're not actually planning on ever cutting their trees down. Another nice thing about IFM projects is because they're taking place in the developed world, they have a lot higher success rate. So reforestation projects and avoided deforestation projects, I've seen fall flat on their face. And it happens more often for avoided deforestation projects. It's particularly difficult in countries with a weak legal framework, where illegal loggers can just come in and take the trees and not face any repercussions. But since improved forest management projects are taking place mostly in the United States and Canada uh, and even Mexico, uh, these are countries with strong legal foundations where if you cut the trees down illegally, you're just going to get sued. <laughs> so nobody's really doing that, right? Despite these, these nicer qualities, improved forest management projects have some real problems. And I have a hard time supporting a large number of them. One of the biggest problems is with additionality. So is the project really justified? And one thing that we've seen happen a lot is conservation organizations are buying up forest land and enrolling for improved forest management projects. Now, the fundamental assumption of an improved forest management project is that these forests were at risk, that somebody was going to cut this down, that these trees need to be preserved so that they can grow and remove CO2 from the atmosphere. But a lot of improved forest management projects are sponsored by organizations like the Massachusetts Audubon Society, like the Nature Conservancy, uh, the Appalachian Mountain Club, and countless small land trusts across the country. Were these organizations really going to cut their forests down? 
Absolutely not. And so these projects are, are more or less worthless. I've seen improved forest management projects take place on recreational ski slopes, on, on forest land that are, that are part of urban college campuses, on nature reserves that have been preserved for almost 100 years prior to this. And so all of the credits that were being sold from this, they more or less have no value because these trees were going to grow anyway. Another major problem with improved forest management is the way that their baselines are calculated. And the way that this works for a lot of projects is that you're basically going to simulate what would have happened to this land if the project didn't exist. And so people use uh, modeling software to simulate how the forest would have grown and then how they would have cut it down. And one of the biggest issues with this is that people simulate extremely aggressive harvest scenarios. So for example, a lot of these projects taking place on the East Coast will simulate extremely aggressive clear cuts. And one of the problems with that is that on the East Coast, clear cutting is not very common. One of the reasons for that is that the forest just doesn't grow back very easily. It's better to partial harvest so that young trees are then able to grow back in partial shade. Despite this, we will see claims that these projects would have been clear cut even though that's not the best management practice of the region, and almost nobody out there is clear-cutting their forest. So the modeling behind these projects, what you're allowed to simulate are, is what's legally permissible, not what's likely to actually happen. Now, there are a couple of different registries that certify improved forest management projects, and not all are equal. The American Carbon Registry has some of the worst projects that I've looked at. I've very rarely seen any improved forest management projects sponsored by them, that I think have a plausible baseline scenario or plausible additionality. On the other hand, the Climate Action Reserve has some of the best improved forest management projects. Uh, almost all of the ones that I've looked at are nearly flawless. They have a protocol that's basically ironclad. And as a result, they end up issuing a lot fewer credits than the American Carbon Registry. And their credits usually tend to sell for a little bit more. Finally, uh, the California Air Resources Board credits, they're somewhere in the middle. For the most part, their protocols are pretty solid. Their baselines, however, are actually calculated in a slightly different way. And the way that they work is that they actually divide the country up into super sections, areas that have supposedly similar ecology to one another. Uh, and then they'll take a look at the average management of those areas. And they'll say, well, you're doing better or worse than the average. And if you're doing better, for example, you'll, get, you'll receive a reward in credits. It's been noted by some folks at Carbon Plan that by doing this, they're kind of incentivizing people to manipulate the system by picking projects inside the eco zones uh, that favor the most issuance of credits. And one example that the carbon plan put out was that there's an eco zone in California that includes redwood forests on one side of it and dry mountain pine forests on another. Uh, and the result is that people are heavily incentivized to enroll the redwood forest because they receive a lot of credits because they're above the regional average. Uh, and they're not incentivized at all to enroll forests that are, for example, a bunch of gray pine. As a result, almost all of the projects in this eco zone are huddled along the side and are consisting of redwoods. And so the California Air Resources Board, you know, the protocol has a couple of problems. Maybe there's a little bit of over issuance. It's not as bad as American Carbon Registry. Now, the next problem that I come across with IFM projects is gerrymandering. And what I mean by this is people will draw the boundaries of their project around the tallest trees. As I discussed, there's a, a strong incentive for your project to have more carbon than the regional average. And so if you can just isolate the biggest trees on your project and make those trees the project and ignore the rest, then you're going to receive a lot more credits up front. And so what I've seen is people drawing extremely squiggly lines around areas that are unlikely to have ever been harvested. Maybe these are islands. Maybe these are deep ravines. Maybe they're just drawing the squiggles around the buffer zone of, a, of a, a river that they couldn't otherwise harvest. So this is really problematic. And I always have to check whether or not the project boundaries make sense given the protocol because of this. Finally, I do think it's worth pointing out that for some reason, improved forest management projects tend to have a higher natural risk than the other project types. We just see forests that are more prone to wildfire being enrolled for improved forest management projects. And so some of these projects, you know, they're great on paper, everything about them is great, but they're taking place in ecosystems in which they're just timber boxes. They're gonna burn down at some point. To say that these forests aren't gonna burn after 40 or 100 years is, is a little irresponsible. And so a lot of these projects that are taking place in Eastern Oregon or Washington or California or, or even Mexico, um, these are projects that I would consider to be high risk. The final thing to consider about improved forest management is that, like all other project types, harvesting is allowed. Now, like I said, 
reforestation projects almost always harvest their trees. They almost always clear cut all the trees they plant and then replant them. And even avoided deforestation projects harvest some percentage of the trees in the native rainforest that they're protecting. And this is often okay. But improved forest management is a project type that is actually centered around improving management outcomes of the forest. And so this is something we want to encourage. There are a lot of forests out there that are being managed quite heavily. The entire idea behind this is to shift people's perspectives from short-term thinking, where you can collect a lot of money on timber right now, to more long-term thinking, where if you leave more timber on the forest, you're going to do better for the environment, and you're also going to do better for the next generation. A lot of forest management practices are actually quite beneficial for the forests. In the United States, we have a lot of forests that are regenerating from old agricultural fields. And in order to be pushed towards a state that more resembles old growth, that maybe is more beneficial for the ecology, for the wildlife, a lot of the time light harvesting can really help with that. It can help promote shade tolerant and rare species, and it can help establish a new generation of trees. And so we have to make sure that we don't get scared off by something like harvesting. Like I said, a lot of improved forest management projects don't harvest at all, but of the ones that do, I've almost always seen good outcomes. So in summary, improved forest management projects have a lot to offer. By preserving a full-grown forest that's already got ecosystems intact, uh, we don't have to wait decades for these trees to grow before they're actually providing habitat for wildlife or recreational opportunities or water filtering services. These projects offer real removals of carbon from the atmosphere. And because they take place in the developed world, there's a strong legal foundation to them. You can trust that these projects are not going to be illegally logged. On the other hand, improved forest management projects are quite often the most commonly manipulated project type. And the reason behind this mostly has to do with additionality. We see a lot of forests that were already being conserved enrolling for these projects. We see aggressive baselines that were unlikely to actually take place if the project didn't exist. We see gerrymandering in which people are drawing the boundaries around their project in a way that favors more credits being issued. Finally, they do sometimes have natural risk, but it depends on the actual project. And so we have to take all these into account, but I would say the best improved forest management projects, I would much prefer sponsor over planting trees from scratch or protecting a forest that is not actually removing carbon from the atmosphere. And so despite these problems, it is still my favorite carbon project type. And there will always be room in my heart for forests like this that still have a lot of carbon to sequester over the course of their lifetime.